You have to un Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Mm. So please take the time to um, be with the whole group of people. It's a Sunday sitting, so there's more than the weekend and month-long month retreat. It's great. Yay. <laughs> Mm. It's like a beautiful garden of everybody. Mm. Mm. Just had to let, uh, Every time we do these either retreats or Sunday sittings, there's always someone who registers like two minutes before. Hmm. And of course, since it's a different Zoom link than normal, I contemplate allowing them to be owners of their action <laughs> oh. or the depths of my compassion or not <laughs> to get them in. So hopefully this last person will make it in. Hard, hard to give the talk and be running the Zoom, that's for sure. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. So, as most of you know, we've um, been focusing all month on these uh, weekend retreats, uh, month long, month long period of practice focused on these weekend intensive retreats um, on the four Brahma Viharas of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And so we're just um, coming to the end of our weekend on equanimity practice. And as Michelle said that, yes, some people are continuing on this week for a week of practice or the culmination of their month of silent intensive practice. So it's a very beautiful time and beautiful to I don't know, have a sense of it kind of coming to fulfillment. And one of the one of the parts I always love about these online retreats is the um, early morning walking meditation with everyone. It's been fun to be you know, getting up and, and doing that practice in a sort of shared way. And this weekend has been beautiful. Uh, I noticed yesterday morning, um, as I got out there, Venus and the little last little crescent of the moon were kind of right next to each other in the east. Very stark against the kind of black sky still at that hour. And then um, as the walking continued this sort of dissipating some some of the real beauty of these purples and pinks coming out in the sky and then the sun getting so bright that they start to vanish you know into the intensity of the sunlight and then this morning the moon just a little lower now than than Venus and just a powerful way to 
be able to stand there, you know, especially kind of before starting the formal walking practice and having these experiences come through of just deep appreciation, deep um, sense of just that the beauty <laughs> that's possible, you know, in the natural world and sometimes it's maybe the sense of our place in it. And then as it dissipates, you know, the, the fading of that, maybe the contraction of the heart around the pain of, of loss of that. And then in the practicing of the equanimity of just that acceptance of, of things are as they are, that this is the truth of things, that nothing is ever stopping. Think it's always moving. All of all conditioned phenomena are just rolling on. And so this way of, you know, being able to feel that full range of beautiful emotions and in relationship to perhaps other emotions, you know, uh, more difficult ones, more challenging ones around craving or wanting more. Sometimes that sense of our minusculeness in the universe can be overwhelming in a negative way, you know, when the equanimity isn't present. So just how beautiful, how fortunate we are to be able to have these opportunities of cultivating all of these things and seeing how they relate together. You know, maybe they're sort of sequential. You know, there are ways in which they can happen sort of sequentially. They're, yesterday morning, you know, part of it too is as the, the sun comes out and, you know, the the world awakens in a certain way. And so there's often more bird song, you know, starts to arise. And sometimes it's just a single bird and then the kind of chorus of birds. And, you know, for me, it can go from this sort of deep, just sense of the connecting, you know, with metta for this being that I hear. And then as it grows, a sense of sometimes overwhelm and chaos of their lives, you know, the stress. I see the anxiety of running to and fro to build a house, to get food, to survive, you know. The bird songs may be pleasant on some level, but they aren't necessarily representing happy expressions all of the time, you know. So the compassion and appreciation when seeing a bird, you know, get some morsel, stealing the cat's food or something like that, you know. And then, yeah, the equanimity of just, this is the nature of things. This is samsara. It's the beauty and sorrows and the cycles of this and the reproduction of all of it over and over and over again in every single moment of action. It's taken so much of the time. And so there are ways we, we can sort of see them sequentially. You know, you start to fathom a kind of logic or intuitive coherence of these Brahma Viharas in a sequential way. And then of course, there's times where it just, it doesn't need to be one or the other, you know, that the heart mind may feel more balanced just with with all of them. You know, the sort of response that is, tender, but also balanced, um, caring, and also peaceful. Sometimes very subtle or sometimes very profound experience can be hard to describe, but very beautiful, very important to be open to and to see the way in which training develops our ability to attune to that space, to value it, to be nurtured by it, to see the wisdom and the beauty of it. Like I said in a talk last week, it's part of it too is it's important to recognize the the way that it re represents like a maturity of mind that we're valuing, uh, a multi-dimensional richness of mind that is 
the result of this process, not a deadening of the mind, not a vacuousness of response, you know, um, this sense that, that people can feel like, oh, that this is all just leading towards a sort of like kind of terrifying emptiness that's just dissociated from reality. And when you practice these Brahma Viharas, it's like we recognize, of course, that's not the case at all, but that we tend to want to think that and treat our minds and treat everyone else's minds as if they should really be very one dimensional. You know, that the appropriate response to this is compassion. And if you feel peace, then there's something wrong. Or the appropriate response to this is peace. But if you feel compassionate towards these people, then you're wrong, right? Uh, or X or Y thing. And that's such a painful prison <laughs> to be putting ourselves in and putting everyone else in. And it's, it's so ridiculous, right? This idea that there's only one appropriate response to any particular reality we encounter. The idea that we might have like complex emotional <laughs> like world, right? And, and, a, and a rich and nuanced response of the heart towards the joy and sorrow in the world, right? Partly depending on conditioning, but also recognizing that perhaps the, the most liberated heart has maybe the most pure and also complex response, right? Complex in terms of paradox, hard to fathom sometimes for us, but how beautiful and how tragic it is that we try and feel that our response should be limited, right? That our, our world should be confined to our views or beliefs or ideas about um, right and wrong, good and bad, and worthiness and unworthiness. What is a mind that can hold all of it? unperturbed by that openness, by that lack of differentiation that is not a lack of discernment. A little a poem by Stonehouse that I like goes through our for postures. Stonehouse, a 14th century Chinese hermit, poet. Four mountain postures. Walking in the mountains, unconsciously drudging along, grab a vine, Climb another ridge, standing in the mountains. How many dawns become dusk? Plant a pine, a tree of growing shade. Sitting in the mountains, zigzag yellow leaves fall. Nobody comes. Close the door and make a big fire. Lying in the mountains. Pine wind enters the ears. For no good reason, beautiful dreams are torn apart. You know, that's like the, the beauty of the heart that can hold all of that. The, the peacefulness, the grief, the, the loneliness, the peace, the the casualness. The integrity. The determination. The ease. Why do we have this idea that to be enlightened is 
to just be love, right? Or just be non-attachment and not identified. Where is our ability to see how these things grow and support and nourish and purify one another along our long paths of liberation? Often with the equanimity practice, we will, you know, hear this question of, you know, how can I, how can I be at peace with the world when there's so much suffering? How can I be at peace with all of the suffering in the world? It's like, maybe that's not the place to start. You know, (laughs) like, let's start with like the itch on your nose, you know, and like, let's try being at peace with that. (laughs) You know, can we find some like inkling of equanimity toward something manageable? And when we see how hard that is, maybe, maybe we feel humble enough to think that full enlightenment might not be the most imminent danger we're in, you know? But it's it's true for all of them, right? How how do we risk loving, knowing that everyone is going to die? You know that that might not form as a thought as concretely, but it's often a big part of that dynamic of the resistance to caring so much. Right? Or how do we care about so much suffering when every, you know, beings just won't stop eating each other? You know, how are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to kind of hold these paradoxes? How, how do we have this unrestrained joy for the happiness of others knowing that it won't last? That it cannot last? Right, the the pleasant the the conditions of the world are not sustainable for any conditioned thing to sustain beyond the moment of those conditions being a certain way. You know, so it's like maybe we don't always concern ourselves with the utmost of all of them. There's going to be something inspiring about that of like, oh, right, my mind, a heart that can be that caring, can be that compassionate, can be share in the joy, can be that peaceful. Of course, you know, we want to be inspired by it, but also um, to be skillful and humble and realistic in terms of what actually our mind is able to, what are the conditions of the mind right now to be able to be present with in these these ways and to understand that none of these get developed independently that if they're going to be developed they need to be developed with each other right and that these these paradoxes are are resolved through the development of all of them little by little You know, we see, oh, like, you know, being in agony about something is not the same as caring about it, right? In a very literal way that that is, caring feels like one thing (laughs) and grief feels like another thing and that they may be moving back and forth very quickly, right? And the loss of one and the, the, the patterns of grief and care and agony and, you know, and hope you know, all of these things are powerfully entangled and happening so quickly in the mind. It's, it's, a, it's why so much energy gets put into our vipassana practice of trying to observe, trying to watch, trying to understand, right? How things can feel so 
connected and interconnected, but also not entangled, right? And, and what is the, the difference between one side or the other of that? There's a, um, I can't remember, Steve and Michelle both mentioned someone who last weekend who said, who wrote, or a couple who wrote, um, gratitude is dependency acknowledged. And um, it reminded me of um, something that uh, Frederick Engels wrote, which is that freedom is dependency acknowledged. I think there's something so profound about that on many levels. So, so much because in part that there is a deep current in all of us that can feel that freedom is just the opposite of dependency, right? That it's independent is the, the nature of freedom, right? But this idea that freedom is dependency acknowledged is something that I think actually resonates very deeply with our practice. It isn't to say that dependency is freedom, but the, it's the acknowledgement, similarly with the gratitude as uh, dependency acknowledged, right? It's the, it's the consciousness of that, the awareness of, in our case, conditionality, of, of the incredible dependency of conditions to lead to uh, other effects, right? Of essentially this truth of cause and effect. That all conditioned things are dependent upon those conditions to sustain themselves. And when those conditions change, the objects themselves change, right? The phenomena themselves dissipate or intensify or whatever. It's a very fundamental part about this tradition and, and others, right? This idea uh, that freedom is the understanding of these things, is the understanding of, of conditionality. Even Sri Nazarkadatta says something to the effect, like the opposite of ignorance is the cause of inevitability. Right? It's the same, same thing. It's like by not seeing, by not acknowledging dependent origination, conditionality, comma, cause and effect, by not acknowledging the nature of things and, and the nature of phenomena, that things become inevitable, right? That greed, hatred, and delusion are, are the, and you know, ignorance is the, is the cause of total predictable behavior, total predictable outcomes. And so this process of understanding the nature of phenomena, the nature of the interaction of phenomena as our doorway to freedom, as our doorway to peace, right? This particular flavor of freedom we talk about this weekend of equanimity. Entirely dependent upon insight, upon overcoming ignorance and understanding the conditionality of our experience. These are, there are so many examples where the Buddha kind of, uh, you know, expounds upon various elements of conditionality, right, of, of dependence of one thing on another, and then where, how liberation comes to play in that. So here are just a couple. The four modes of clinging have what as their cause? What is their origin? From what are they born? From what do they arise? These four forms of uh, craving Clinging, have craving as their cause, craving as their origin, are born from craving and arise from craving. What does craving has a, have as its cause? Feeling tone, Vedana. 
what does feeling tone have as its cause? Contact between the sense sensitivity and an external object. What does contact have as its cause? The six sense spheres. What do the six sense spheres have as their cause? Name and form, name and form, consciousness, consciousness, process, process, ignorance, right? Rebirth, this coming to being conditioned by ignorance. So the Buddha sort of like breaks down the sense of being and, and, and the process of being and, and of self identification and a meanness in this sort of way of like resulting in, you know, craving for sense objects that are the result of all of these other previous condition. And as soon as ignorance is abandoned and clear knowledge arises, this practitioner from the fading of ignorance and the appearance of clear knowledge clings neither to sensual pleasure as a sustenance, nor to views as a sustenance, nor to precepts and practices as a sustenance, nor to doctrines of the self as a sustenance. Not clinging, unsustained, they are not agitated. Unagitated, they are totally unbound, right within. They discern birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task is done. There is nothing further for this world. different version of a similar formulation. It is natural that in a virtuous person, one of consummate virtue, freedom from remorse will arise, right? So someone committed to sila, to ethical conduct, consummate in their sila, that freedom from remorse will arise. It is natural that in a person free of remorse, gladness will arise. That in a person, that in a glad person, rapture will arise. That for an enraptured person, the body will be calmed. For the person of calm body will feel pleasure. That the mind of a person feeling pleasure will become concentrated. A person whose mind is concentrated will see things as they actually are. That a person seeing things as they actually are will grow disenchanted and dispassionate. And that a disenchanted and dispassionate person will realize the knowledge and vision of release. These ways in which this process unfolds, right, this, the, the, the deepest experiences of equanimity, of peace, right? That come through insight, that come through understanding. And that through that, this, this process of disenchantment and release, right? Of letting go of, of uh, letting go of the clinging, letting go of the expectation and the enchantment, the, the expectation that objects are going to be ultimately fulfilling, right? That anything is ultimately stable enough to provide um, stability for that happiness or for our gladness. And so this understanding of like how freedom of this kind of process arises through the process of this dependent origination, right? Of watching the body and watching the mind, watching the six sensors, watching their interaction, you know, watching the clinging, understanding this, you know, it's not simply about, uh, like behavior modification. We need to see the way in which clinging leads to continued existence, right? That craving leads to continued bondage, uh, hatred, aversion, ignorance. And then it that notion and the practical experience of insight and understanding being able to dramatically shift, right? But then how it can come from all of these angles. It's not just a matter of like pointing the attention at something and watching it. This idea of like, oh, how does moral action lead to liberation? 
oh, through the non-remorse and the gladdening of the mind. And the mind that is glad has more access to happiness and pleasure and calm and concentration, right? That you start to move into these categories that are very fundamental in terms of practice. And so this idea of like, while well, we're practicing the inclination of the mind toward these beautiful qualities of the Brahma Viharas, you know, that we're trying to do it not just as a <clears throat> overlay, you know, not just as a concentration practice, but also through understanding, through seeing the resistance. Oh, why are we resistant to equanimity right now? Why are we resistant to compassion or to tenderness of heart? Why are we resistant to just being here, you know, in this moment? How important that is as part of the process. Uh, it's it's wonderful sometimes to see the ways you know through the question and answer periods or in particular these these understandings become illuminated by people just in their own practice you know that it isn't our guidance or our instructions or our telling you how to interpret things you know this this sense um, you know around a, a number of things but this relationship between equanimity and responsibility, how profound that is, you know, this understanding and, and what is so beautiful and, and incredible about it is it's like, on one hand, it points to the almost unfathomable, almost unbearable responsibility that each of us bear in terms of our actions but that it also points to the utter limit of our responsibility, right? That, that to our actions, <laughs> that, that actually beyond what we have the ability to, to, to do out of our, like volitionally, that we actually don't have control over the lives of others. That no matter, you know, how much we care and how much we feel compassion or how much joy we have, that we cannot sustain the joy of another person, that we cannot uh, ensure that another person has no sorrow or no suffering. And so this incredible boundary and then the profundity of the truth within that boundary, and how amazing that is and how humbling that is. And, and of course, in some ways is the crux of what takes so long in this unfolding. You know, we sit and we close our eyes and there's just this incredible flood of fabrication that arises. And it is important to remember at times that it's an ancient flood, you know, there are parts of what you go through that you will recognize <laughs> from your own life, from your own actions, right? You're like remorse or, or pride, you know, healthy pride or unhealthy pride, whatever. Like the sense of like memory of something we had done that we are now living with the result of internally, you know, whatever reality it may have externally we see that it's like, oh, we are the inheritors of our own actions, right? In terms of our own hearts bearing the truth of the skillful and unskillful actions that we have done in this lifetime. We recognize it. We've gone through various processes around it. But also when we get quiet and maybe some of the this process of identification that happens in the mind, you start to see that it's, it's sort of cherry picking mental experience to identify with and that there's a lot that's kind of rolling through that is not so clearly you right or familiar 
or something you feel particularly responsible for, right? There's a lot that's coming through that is the action of others, right? Or beyond this lifetime, right? Of you know, archetypal constructions and, you know, countless unfathomable um, dhammas, iterations of, of, of phenomena that, that are rolling on <laughs> through us, you know, through our lives, through our actions. It, it's sort of like, you know how when they have, now that they've started like understanding genetics and like DNA, there was a part when they first started like um, categorizing, you know, people's DNA and being able to like show the, the whole person's genome or whatever. There was all this stuff that like was not clear what it was for. And so they had this immediately, of course, these scientists were like, oh, that's junk DNA, right? Like we don't know what it's for. And so therefore it's like, <laughs> like junk, you know, like <laughs> the arrogance of that, right? Well, there's some similar process that happens. And I think with us, right. Of like, there's just like all this gobbledygook and it's like, we don't necessarily have a sense of like, oh, how that particular weird un undefinable notion, <laughs> you know, has kind of helped construct us and is constructing us in this present moment. But I think it's like, there's some sense of, of, of confidence that um, that it is not personal, but it is also not nothing, right? That this has come from somewhere and is going on to somewhere based on our actions. And that there is something important about starting to let that flood of experience you know, the, the non-identification with things as we get more aware of, of that things being conditioned by past action, by, by past action and by past influence, that there's a, a less taking of it personally. And so you start to see more of the sort of other stuff that might seem extraneous, right? Or hard to define, hard to determine, hard to identify with. And that there's something very important about like the openness to that, right? And sometimes the confusion of that and the weirdness of that and recognizing that we are not responsible, right, for the flood of experience that's happening right now, that is befalling us right now, but that we are entirely responsible about what happens from this point onward, right? It doesn't mean that, that we weren't involved in the actions of the past, right? But there's something different, right? Of being like, nothing can be done about that at this point, right? By the time it crashes down upon us, this present moment and this flood of fabrications, the only thing we have responsibility for is what comes next. And that it's total responsibility. Which is just to say that when the motivation of dealing with this flood of fabrications is something like greed, craving, hatred, anger, ignorance, delusion, confusion, that that is going to have certain outcomes that we have responsibility for, right? And the degree to which it is kindness and generosity and equanimity and mudita, karuna, that there's a beauty that comes from that. Right, and that there is a, a, a responsibility in that too, that we are the inheritors of those actions. Just as in the way of the person committed to ethical conduct has a mind free of remorse and that freedom from remorse has a capa easier capacity towards gladness, easier capacity towards concentration, right? The sense that, that we do bear this incredible responsibility for this flood that's happening right now. And of course, we, we don't have the perfectly developed tools to attend to each moment of that perfectly. And so we admit some fallibility, right? We admit some imperfection and the willingness to heal relationships that we may have harmed, to try to undo damage that we might have done, right? To show up for something in the next moment that maybe we couldn't in that moment, you know, as these fleeting moments give us opportunity for. That we understand 
the conditionality of things, that this, these qualities of heart are not yet sufficiently capable of dealing with this degree of overwhelm, this degree of anger, this degree of unpleasant experience, whatever, or that they are sufficiently capable of dealing with this degree of craving, this degree of delusion, this degree of aversion, what have you, and taking stock and, and, and feeling the goodness of that as well so that we have the access to the tenderness, the care for the heart in general. We have the compassion for the overwhelm. We have the joy and the sense of capacity that's growing. And we have the equanimity of simply understanding. Things are as they are, doing our best. And there are imperfections. And we're willing to show up for the results of those because we want to grow, we want to learn, we want to develop. We want to understand more fully. And I think we also have to recognize that we use greed, hatred, and delusion as a way to also kind of put the brakes on the overwhelming aspect of this flood. You know, it's like, as you were saying earlier, yes, you know, we're dealing with unpleasant, we're dealing with pleasant, we're dealing with neutral, and that the mind is trying to respond to those in a wholesome way, but of course there are all these conditioned ways. And so we're dealing with the immediate sense of that. But I think what's also very powerful is to recognize that the ways in which the mind is staying agitated on purpose, that if you know, those of us who've like been practicing this equanimity, in particular, it can come to more stark relief that when there is this kind of quietude and settledness, that it's not like some object comes and throws it out of balance, but that the mind itself starts to long for something more stressful, right? It longs for the agitation of the, the tension of wanting, of craving, of distraction, of anger. Because there's a way, it's like, it's like that surface tension of water that it creates our identity. It's the sense of who we are is entirely that tension. And you could say that's all it is, is the tension of wanting or not wanting. The, the tension that arises from not seeing clearly is that sense of self. And the fear that when that tension is gone, that everything will come to a, an end, right? That everything will come to a stop. And to know that this is a very understandable fear, right? Because that is exactly what happens. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what the Buddha describes, right? That's exactly like the description of a moment of nibbana it's like without the clinging without the duk, 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 everything stops right and there's a peace in that but it's very understandable that that peace is scary to us right that the system does not totally trust that degree of stopping right? And that, so there's an investment in samsara. There's an investment in keeping things going, even with this degree of agitation, because it feels more familiar. It feels safe, right? Um, that there is a, a, a fear of the non-being, right? Of, of an abyss or something like that. And so there, it's like this respect for that tension, respect for that fear, respect for trusting also that it won't happen until the mind is ready for it to happen, you know, and that that, and, and even when it happens, it's like, there's a little dent, you know, and it's like, you need, there's like quite a few dents that need to happen before it fully happens, right? Before someone becomes like totally okay 
with everything falling apart, with everything collapsing, not needing to reconstruct it, not needing to come back into being with each moment, understanding that all conditions in the mind and body will play out their natural course, that there is no need, you know, to keep shoring them up, keep firming them up, keep restructuring them out of our anxiety, out of our worry, out of our wanting, our longing, you know, for ourselves or for the world. But that it takes so much faith, so much trust rooted in wisdom for that degree of equanimity, right, to happen. And that there's no forcing it. There's no, there's no degree which you can just be like, inclining mm, out. It's not just a matter of enforcing equanimity on the mind, right? or in kind of insisting on acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. It's like, there is, there are ways in which, um, I'll say for myself, that it was very important for me to see that equanimity was a more uh, natural inclination of the mind than some of the other factors of awakening or um, some of the other Brahma Viharas. And that there's a way that any of us can go quite a distance with our strengths, right? Um, and that for me, there was a, a certain point where I was made aware <laughs> that my inclination towards acceptance and and letting go and uh, not getting involved and and unhooking though powerful and and honest and earnest was not balanced through something like interest another factor of awakening that i that i actually wasn't really interested in phenomena i really just wanted to like disappear right and get out of them and get out of the way i wanted them to go away and that at some point there's some reckoning there that needs to happen. We're all different in terms of our strengths and weaknesses, but um, and, and more developed and less developed of the factors of awakening or the factors of the Brahma Viharas. But to recognize that equanimity without interest, without investigation, right? Without then in the mindfulness that's required of investigation can never get us that profoundly liberated, right? Without that, the depth of liberation um, that is the, you know, ultimate truth and promise of this path and this practice. And so we shouldn't worry about it. If you're practicing equanimity, that you'll disappear. <laughs> And just to, like, you know, that I was thinking of that song of like, um, down by the riverside, you know, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield. <sighs> to really take in that it's not just laying down your sword, right? That actually it's like laying down the shield is maybe harder and that there's no rush, you know? It's like, it happens when we recognize there's no threat, right? That there's only relief. And until then, it's like compassion, compassion, <laughs> equanimity with the resistance, you know, care, mudita, all these things are like the good natural response. You know, what, what will we do when we are, you know, if we are fortunate enough to know that we are dying and to have any wherewithal in that time, which is not a given, right? As we all know. 
the sense of like, oh, we might get on some level that, that that's our job. Letting go is our job. And are we going to be not willing to do that because things aren't quite finished in the world, in our lives? Things are not resolved. Yes, of course, we know people have that exact exact thing happen, right, at the process of death. The sense of, like, unfinished. Something isn't quite done, whether it's abstract or concrete of people holding on. And of course, right, we have to have compassion for the depths of our own, whatever degree that happens for us, you know. It's like, of course, you know, can we laugh? Can we have a little humor with like all these years of training? And I'm still, <laughs> as Michelle likes to say, in the sense of like, is there any humor with that? And then is there any place of like, okay, right, knowing that ultimately there is this task of letting go of our freedom does not depend on everything being perfect in the world and fixed in the world and resolved and every check, you know, every box being checked, that we will die with things unfinished. We will leave a mess on some level, right? And there is a way, of course, that we practice every moment like that, right? Not in the agitation of like, you might die any moment, so you need to practice hard. Yes, that's one side of things, but not without the like anxiety, <laughs> not with the harshness of that. But is there a calm of that, of being like, right, these things can happen anytime. What are we cultivating in the heart? What are we cultivating in the mind? Where do we have any faith in phenomena rolling along their natural condition path and coming to an end in their natural conditioned way and not needing to make anything more of that. Where do we find some sense of rest and faith in the truth of that? in the nature of that, for all phenomena. The last reading. Vacha is talking with the Buddha. Just as a fire, watch out, burns with sustenance and not without sustenance, even so I declare the rebirth of one who has sustenance and not one, not of one without sustenance. But Venerable Gotama, at the moment a flame is being swept on by the wind and goes a far distance, what do you say is its sustenance then? Right, we have these fires. We know what that is from. One house is burnt, and perhaps the, the you see the wind right blows this flame and catches on another house. Vacha, when a flame is being swept on by the wind and goes a far distance, I say that is it is wind sustained. The wind vacha is the sustenance at that time. And at the moment when a being sets this body aside and has not yet attained another body, what do you say is its sustenance then? Right? From one house to the next. When a being, when one body dies and it has not yet gone to the next body, what's sustaining that being? Actually, watch a, when a being sets this body aside and has not yet attained another body, I say that it is craving sustained. Craving, watcha, is its sustenance at that time. And so we have this 
as a framework for, of course, rebirth and things that you may or may not resonate with. Um, but, it, but we can see the sense of like, oh, from one concrete thing, from one moment of matter, materiality, to another moment of materiality, what is it that's sustaining that connection, that identification, that fire? What is it that's sustaining the fire of continued existence from one moment to the next, right? This is not just one lifetime to the next. It's one moment to the next. It's fire of craving. Craving rooted in ignorance and not understanding, right? Aversion as simply the other side of the same coin. And with the extinguishment of that flame, the peace of not coming back into being, the rest, the coolness of that extinguishment. Something we all have to look forward to with great equanimity. Let's uh, sit for a few moments. Thank you all. Wonderful to see you. For those of you moving on to your week, good luck tomorrow. For those of you continuing on with the retreat tonight or in the next moments, good luck. <laughs> May we all be well and take care of ourselves. See you soon. See you at the Metta Chant or next Sunday. Thank you. <laughs>